All right, good morning. good morning. Thank you for taking your time this early morning, joining us on a Windows 10 deployment session, deep dive expert level. It'll be a fun 75 minutes of just live demos combined with a few set of slides. My name is Johan. I work for a small consulting company back in Sweden, Knowledge Factory. This is Michael Nyström, works for another consulting company, actually a bitter competitor, Trusec, but of course, we happen to do a lot of these events together, so we, we stay friends. Almost friends. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if you have any questions throughout the session, we are a bunch of people in here, so what we will do directly after the session, we will quickly you know, rig our gear down, and we'll be outside, and we will have the Q&I there, so you can ask. We will be there as long as you have questions, put it that way. And please follow us on Twitter, um, and not only follow us, check the people that we follow, because we try to follow the Uber gurus in OSD, in Config Manager, in Windows 10 deployment, geeks like, Mike over here, like Jason over there, and Niehaus, and all these guys that really knows a lot about deployment. So it allows you to very quickly, every single day, get a good grasp of what's going on in the MDT and the Config Manager space. But with that, we have a uh, word from our sponsor. All right, let's go. Mike, you're up. Am I? Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, even if we um, uh, are doing the new, brand new Windows 10 with all the new oh, features. Uh, 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 sorry. Uh, uh, one more thing. Everything that we do here on stage today is not supported until next week. <laughs> when Service Pack 2 is out. I just want to make that clear. Now we can go on for Config Manager. So yeah. will everything be supported next week? Because I think we do things that has never been supported. <laughs> no, it's supported. We are oh, using okay. the built-in component, so it is supported. Yeah. Yep. So uh, on record. Yep. <laughs> let's get back to the reference image. Um, you still need to create a reference image. Uh, well, you need to have two. You need to have the plain vanilla image to be able to do in-place upgrades, but to be able to do new computer refresh and replace, we still need to have a reference image. Uh, both Johan and I use Microsoft Deployment Toolkit, uh, and the new version is gonna be update one, which supports Windows 10. Um, eventually. Eventually, when it's released. And it's the same story as always. You need to add your application, you need to add your patches, and you need to add a bunch of settings um, to make this a really great uh, reference image. So why don't we use Configuration Manager for that? Well, it lacks a couple of things that we need. Both Johan and I work as consultant. That means that we charge the customer for every hour that we work. And to make that time less, so we can earn less 
money? That didn't sound good. Um, we need to have something that is fast and that, that is reliable and is always works. Also, we work in different environments. Both Joe and I work with servers and clients and other things as well. And just using Configuration Manager to create a reference image doesn't work that well because it can only be used in Configuration Manager. So then I need to have another method for the VDI solution and another method for the for the VMware or Hyper-V environment, or whatever it is. VMM, yeah. yeah. Um, we also like the ability to test. So one thing that I do is that when I create my reference image task sequence, I would like to run it without patches really fast, and that's easy to turn off, and then I can just enable that. And it's, it's just easier to, to test and try, so it saves time. Save a few hours and you get a very compliant, compatible image that yeah. you can use with basically everything. So There's two things, though, that is kind of special. Well, the suspend and copy profile. Yep. Um, the suspend feature is very nice. Let's say that you manage to automate everything except one little task. Then you throw in a suspend step in the middle of the task sequence. You run it. You manually fix it or you manually create your script or batch file or PowerShell script or whatever it takes to do that step, you can now test it. Okay, no batch files, sorry. It's PowerShell only. Otherwise, it's gonna hit me. Um, so you do that, and once you figure it out, then you can put it in the task sequence. If you can't figure it out today, well, then you can continue using the suspend step. Copy profile is another really nice feature that is sometimes used. Uh, maybe you need to install applications, and those applications need to be tattooed into the image. They need to have certain settings. And those settings will be written in while you do the installation of the application. Or you want to modify something else. You want to have a default profile for every user that is uh, retrieved from the, the, from the machine. And then we can use copy profile. Uh, we can't use copy profile if the image has been created in Configuration Manager since there is no profile ever created. Therefore, copy profile doesn't work at deployment time if the image is done in Configuration Manager. So, flip. Flip. I'm the clicker. You're the clicker. Yes. So, this is Microsoft Deployment Toolkit. Uh, nothing fancy, really. Uh, you've seen this uh, a couple of times before. Here's all my reference images uh, sequences, and they look pretty much the same. I don't have a Windows 10 right on this selection. I have one right here, so. Yeah, it looks the same. But the important thing here is that we need to do things. So before we run the Windows Update step, we install all the applications that we can to minimize the number of updates that is gonna run later on. It, there's no point of running an update of something that you're gonna manually install an application for, for instance. Uh, so in this case, I have a bunch of applications. And we still need to install .NET Framework if you do have .NET Framework 2 and 3 application, most of you have. We still need to install um, uh, the um, uh, Visual C++, so we can have that. Um, in this case, I have IE11 and Silverlight and BG Info as well, but it, it's not important what you add. You just need to add, and I do add them manually, so I have them in a certain order. Maybe you want to enable features and function, that's fine as well. We... Um, Still use for every um, for every image we create, and I just started to fix this for Windows 10 as well. This is a script we run in the end. The machine is now patched; it's fully function. You install all the application, and the image becomes big. You really want to deploy that huge WIM file. Or could we just remove all the patches that has been overwritten in the system, the SSX folder? Yeah, by running the cleanup manager, command line wise, we can throw everything old out of the system to keep the WIM file smaller. And it's becoming really small. So we can shrink it down to like maybe four or five gigs instead of 
10 to 15 gigs in size, which could be the maximum size. We've seen some updates now in Windows 10 that hopefully will reduce the need for doing anything like this, but still for Windows 7 and Windows 8, it's something we do because we can reduce the image by a gig at least in size. And if you have a five gig image or a four gig image, it's actually quite a big difference when you distribute that to a large environment. Yeah. They change a little bit how they link updates and stuff, but uh, yeah. Hopefully that's going away in the yeah. future, but uh, currently we need to run it. So you've done all this, and how do you proceed? Well, the easiest way to proceed is to now to create virtual machines. Of course, you should create a reference image in a virtual machine. You manually fire them up, and then you install Windows, and then you watch the most boring video ever created calling installing Windows. You've seen it all. Um, it was fun in the XP time. Then they had different pictures and things like that. That doesn't happen anymore. Or you start using PowerShell. In PowerShell, we can automatically grab all the task sequences that we have, create a virtual machine for every task sequence that we have, fire them up, let them be installed, captured, turned off, and deleted. Now, the only thing you now need to do is to schedule a PowerShell script, and then you can watch another movie, something that is slightly more fun. Yeah, we'll have a session on that on next Ignite, how to schedule a task in Windows. Yeah, uh, we also have a three-day training on that. If you ever want to sign up for the how to schedule a script, uh, there is a, we have a class for that. So let's open that up and see how it looks like. Uh, Not the right one. Oh, I had it here. Oh, there you go. Um, nothing fancy. Um, I store a lot of information in an XML file, uh, and then we have a bunch of functions that will load the snap-in from Microsoft Deployment Toolkit. It will then connect to the provider uh, and get all the item properties. And that means I can now control or read everything from the deployment share directly, which is kind of nice. It's gonna create folders, it's gonna copy the boot image, it's gonna check the ISO, it's gonna check if the virtual machine switch is correct, and then it's gonna create all the virtual machines. You wanna see it in action? Yes. Okay. I have seen it before, but it's nice. Automation. It is. It's nice. <laughs> so um, that is the command to just grab all the task sequences we have so we know what we're going to create. And now he here's the complex thing. You need to run the new auto gen ref images, and then you hit enter here. I can see that. And then it doesn't work. <laughs> and do you know why it doesn't work? <laughs> In this case, no, but I have it working here, if you like. Did you do it on my machine? No. I think, actually, I have the XML file specified incorrectly. No, it's right. Ah, I know why. I'm in the wrong folder. You want me to change the folder? I can change the folder. Two seconds. Let's go there. And let's do C colon backslash CD backslash image factory, image factory script, import module. Like that. New auto. That's better. Yeah, what can possibly go wrong in a live demo? Yeah, the problem when you have a multiple folders with the same name and the same script in different locations, and they are slightly differently configured. Yeah. So what's gonna happen right now, it's very boring, but it's gonna build all the virtual machines, fire them up, install them, sysprep, capture, turn them off, next one, next one, and next one, until all of them are done. That takes approximately 22 hours in our environment because we create reference images for virtual machine servers and clients and for basically any operating system since we have a service provider that requires that for us. 
Um, that's pretty much it. All right. Let's go back to the slides here. That was the demo. Yes. And now it's about time to create sequences. Aha. Uh -huh. In Config Manager, there are quite many things you need to do in to have a full supported Windows 10 sequence that work with all types of hardware and the applications that you have in your environment. So let's get to that. I'm not too, too big fan of a slide, really. All right. Number eight. So that, that was the backup plan. <laughs> okay. Um, when creating reference images in, in Config Manager, you've probably seen that you start by right-clicking the sequence, you select one of the, uh, the, the nodes here, and then you step through a uh, long, long wizard, about 20 pages long. And when you've done that, you start to customize the sequence itself. And that's fun, the first, you know, 10 sequences that you create, but after that you start thinking, isn't there a way to automate this a little bit more? And for example, you can see here that in my template list, I have a template I'm pretty sure you don't have in your list. Even though we have the same type of setup, config manager, friendly tell R2, and MDT integrated. So why is that that I have one and you don't? because I created another template. So where are they stored? How do I create one? Well, it's really difficult. You need to find the folder. No, it's not difficult. You need to find the folder where MDT stores its folders, or its templates. And uh, can you think of any folder that could make sense uh, to store config manager templates in? There are no. two options here, actually. <laughs> it's not templates. It's the actual SCCM folder. That's why I have my templates. So if you want to copy and change these, I can simply do that. So here is an example where I have an entire sequence ready made as a template, and I can start to use that when I create new sequences. So once I have done one that I'm happy with, I can export it, I can add it as a template, and then all the new sequences I create from this one will now be based out of that template. Another thing you can do, of course, is um, use PowerShell to do the same thing. So in Config Manager, there is a um, built-in provider now in PowerShell that allow you to create um, sequences directly out of, the, uh, out of the box. The challenge with this built-in commandment is it's just creating plain vanilla sequences, not that are integrated with Config Manager. And I want them to be integrated with, sorry, not integrated with MDT, I would, and I want them to be integrated with MDT for Config Manager. So how do I do that? Well, turns out there is another script. So here I have a folder which is currently empty. And when I run this script, or the first 13 lines of that script, it will now export every single sequence that I have really quickly to that folder. So now I have an entire folder with all my sequences. And of course, I could go open them up. I can open up, this is a Windows 8 sequence, by the way. Um, and I can do some changes to them. I maybe want to change some built-in variables to give the sequence additional time to do things. We've seen that happens a lot with, with uh, uh, special machines with solid state drives. You may to, to fix these values to maybe five and up to 15 on the time. But you can add whatever you like here. This is a fix for Windows 8.1 deployment, so it doesn't give you that pesky error about group policy identity something when you try to log in the first time. And, but this is just the entire sequence. And if any of you try to export normally from the console, right click and do export of a big sequence that has like 45 driver packages and 50 apps, that's gonna take a while. That can take 45 minutes to do because it does some extensive validations of all those packages. But when I do it in PowerShell, you can see that I exported 17 sequences real quick 
into XML files. And the deal is now I can use the same thing to create new one. So I can say import sequence, specify the site code, the sequence name, awesome Windows sequence for Ignite. And I specify one of the input files that I exported. Um, I can do this one. And I run this and I have a new sequence that is based on that export. So now if I go back and refresh the node here, it should go from 17 sequences until 18 sequences. And one should be awesome Windows sequence for Ignite. And if I edit that sequence, you will see this is a completely integrated um, sequence with all the various big bangs and whistles that, that the MDT adds to it. And this is quite powerful. Think of it. If you work around with sequences and someone in your team or yourself do something bad with that sequence, how do you restore one? How do you grab a copy of it? Well, you have to restore the site server to get back a single sequence. Or you take into habit of exporting them. There are also event handlers in Config Manager that you can call. There is a German fellow, his name is uh, Mike Koster. Uh, used to be an MVP for a long time, but not anymore. But he has written an event handler for Config Manager that will look at events when you edit a sequence. And every time you edit a sequence, an event is triggered and he calls a script that will back up the sequences and give them a version number. So every time you do a change to a sequence, in the back end, background, there will be a backup like I showed you through that PowerShell script. And I just saw, you, I saw me demonstrate how easy it is to actually restore one if you did something bad. And then you can basically just open them up side by side. This is the restored one. This is maybe a new one that you're playing around with. And you can start to compare them and you can start just copy and paste information in between if you like. So it's quite a powerful way to deal with um, settings and exporting sequences. Then we also have some other things you probably want to configure in the sequence and that is support for BitLocker. And the deal with BitLocker is, as you probably know, it's been around for quite a long time now. There are actions in Config Manager by default that, that will happily enable BitLocker. However, it assumes a few things. It assumes that the machine is actually ready for BitLocker. And the deal is, if you buy machines from, say, HP, Dell, Lenovo, wherever you buy machines from, and you don't tell them how you want them configured to you, they will typically ship the machines to you with no password in BIOS, and TPM will not be enabled in BIOS. That's the typical default configuration. So now you need to go and enable that. And, well, that's the time when you try to locate the uh, newest hired, the most suitable technician for the job, give him or her a pair of nice runner shoes and have the staff running around in the buildings pressing F2 or F10 or whatever it is uh, to enable that configuration, or you add that to the sequence. So in this sample, I've added a script that was written by Tim Mintner back in the days, still available on the Deployment Guys blog, that simply checks the status of the TPM chip. Is the machine ready or not? If it's not, I will call this script, so I have a condition on this one, that actually will call the different vendor tools. So if it's an 8P, it will call the BIOS config utility. If it's a Lenovo, it will call their WMI script. If it's a Dell, it will call the CCTK tools. But it's just a script that detects the hardware and calls the right utility and then run that utility. Then reboot the machine. Most hardware, a reboot is enough. Some rare models have to be turned off once and then you can't really do this. But hopefully you don't have those rare models, but then you have to have two sequences basically. One that does the config and one that actually deploys. And then I will check the status again and now finally if the machine is ready to go, then I will call in and do enable a bit locker. Something to watch out for is that the sequence itself is suppressing policies all the time. So there is no group policies being applied at this point in the sequence, meaning if you want to do adjustments for BitLocker, 
for example, a lot of people are relaxing the TPM validation profile because the default one is quite, um, well, extensive. Annoying, <laughs> Annoying yeah. <laughs> oh, you put in a CD in your uh, bay. Oh, please put in the recovery key. Or you have a USB stick, please put in your recovery key. But you have to do that through a script that will put these values into the registry until the machine is rebooted and you do get the normal policies. But this is how you deal with uh, typically deal with, with BitLocker. Uh, you can also do this earlier in the process to uh, use the new provisioning features, which are nice, but all in all, you often have a better success rate and testing rate if you do this in the running OS. The downside, it takes time to encrypt. It can take hours. If you do it early on in the pre provisioning block of the sequence, it doesn't add any time to it. If you want to see some excellent guides on doing that, there is a uh, MVP, uh, Niall Brady, uh, Windows Noob site, you've probably seen it around. He has published some excellent guides on how to work with BitLocker and pre-provisioning to be able to start encryption really early so a deployment only takes 30 minutes and then the machine is completely uh, decrypted. All right, back to slides. And then drivers. Ooh, drivers. Yes. How funny is that? Um, yes, drivers. Uh, we need to have them, um, and we all like them. And they don't cause any issues, because they always work. <laughs> or that's the understatement of the year. Um, we need to find drivers. And I know Johan have been talking about this before, but it's very important. And still, when I go to customer sites, they are using the wrong locations. Drivers, if you have a Dell machine, that's going to be your cab files. You search for Dell, cab, and FTP. And then you're going to find a community site that is run by Dell, and they have the cab files. You download them. If you have a Lenovo, then you search for Lenovo update okay. retriever. If you just search for retriever, you're going to get dogs. <laughs> We've done that. It's so funny every time. If you do have HP, you use the soft pack downloader. And you download the packages. Download manager. Download manager, yes, yeah. that's correct. Um, and what you should really be aware of is that not always you really want to have all the drivers that is in the package. We have uh, numerous customers that have issues because they actually use all the drivers, which is strange. Most common issue is this. The machine is working perfectly fine. However, you can't turn on BitLocker because there's no TPM chip, which is very strange because you know there is a TPM chip inside. If you take the pure media, the ISO image, you install it from that, there is a TPM chip. But if you add all the drivers from the cab file, there is no TPM chip anymore. Isn't that very strange? After a while, you realize that if you install this vendor's security toolkit package, then suddenly the TPM chip pops up again. They have a shim driver that kills the TPM chip driver and enables it back again when you use their application. So that means, of course, now we need to have that application you really want to have that toolkit application, managing it, deploying it, and patch it, and nurse it like a Tamaguchi for the next five years? <laughs> I don't think so. So you need to find a driver that actually kills the TPM chip. And after a while, you're going to figure it out. And hey, here's the driver. So the rule of thumb is this. Only add drivers that you actually need. How do you find need? You need to kill the yellow exclamation marks, period. They need to go away. Number two, focus on storage, network, and graphic. And the rest of it, if you don't use it, it doesn't matter anymore. We have drivers in Windows PE, that's one story, and we have drivers in Windows, but then we have another kind of drivers. Even if you manage to install the driver by itself, 
Maybe, maybe you really need to install the application. Driver applications. Nobody likes them because they are hard to manage, but we need to have them. So if Johan, which is usually a nice guy. <clears throat> yeah, I can click for you. Yes, please do. Um, so drivers, operating system, driver packages. Import them into Configuration Manager, create driver packages, and in this case, if I open my Windows P uh, x64 package, you can see that I have this massive amount of drivers, exactly the ones I really need. We had a session uh, yesterday, and the criteria to, to figure out what kind of drivers you need for Windows P is very simple. Boot it up. If, if you can press F8 and say IP config and you get an IP address, you don't need a network driver. If you can run disk part, list disk, and you see a hard drive, you don't need a disk drive driver either. It's storage. It's, storage drive. it's very simple. Yes, but there are new drivers. Yeah. So? <laughs> but it works. Um, it's like updating drivers. I was actually having a discussion with, with one of the managers for the Windows Update Services, software update services at Microsoft earlier this week, and he asked me, all right, what kind of typical driver updates do you see customers are doing? I say, not much. <laughs> actually, nothing at You only all. update the driver if it's broken. I mean, if it works, it works. Don't touch it. Or if there is a security issue with an application that the, the, the driver is using then, of course, but not think, if it works. I think I heard the expression, uh, if it's not broken, don't fix it. Uh, maybe that applies. <laughs> I don't Could know. be the other way Could around, be. yeah. Uh, okay, so um, this is pretty standard, and most of you have seen this before. Uh, if you open a task sequence, then we use the, uh, the method um, that is called total control, which means that we create one driver package for each and every machine. We turn off the auto-apply drivers, uh, and then we create uh, one driver package for each model, and then we specify that, hey, if this is the model, uh, and you can either do a WMI query or you do a model, it doesn't really matter, um, then you should have this driver package and nothing else. But how do you deal with the applications? What, what we see is that people tend to say, oh, that's easy, I know how to fix that. Okay, so we can see this, and I hate this. I really don't like it, but we see this. So they go here and they create a new group called Hardware Stuff. Okay, and under Hardware Stuff, they then create one folder for every model, and then they add all the applications for each and every model. And if you didn't have a huge task sequence, you will have, well, it's not going to be there, it's going to be later on, it's going to be after state restore. I was just about to say, you probably won't have it in that location. Yeah, I'm going to move <laughs> it down. It's going to be around here somewhere. Uh, it's just that that means that every time you have a new driver package, you need to modify this, and you need to modify the task sequence, and again, and again, and again, and the sequence will be very huge. I don't do that. I do it this way. Number one, I need to find the application. And I'm going to open my folder. And in downloads, I downloaded the um, HP 3D driver guard thing. Maybe we need to install that correctly. Otherwise, it doesn't work. OK, fine. Uh, there's, how do you figure out the silent command for this? You Google for it? Or Bing? Or Bing? Let's Bing. <laughs> Go Bing? <laughs> Go Bing? Uh, soft pack download manager. Which every time you build it will install a new version normally, so. Yeah, it's like Adobe. <laughs> There's a new version coming. Um, when you download it using this tool, it's, it's actually have the ability to tell you the silent command line switch for every application. 
We just need to start it first. Yeah. But I uh, can start it over here and you can continue with yeah, whatever we were doing. Yeah, it's coming. So what I do is that I, oh, here it comes. Yep. It, it's not oh. the best written oh. app in the world, but <laughs> told you, it's a new update. No, you can't yeah. cancel it. Yeah, no. New update every single time. Yeah, whatever. Okay, so while it's doing that, let's go back to my packages application. Uh, can you show the uh, awesome PowerShell script you wrote for the boot image drivers? Yeah, I can do that. But before we do that, here I have a package. Uh, it's very simple. I'm just going to continue with that nasty little thing. Here we have a package that just contains the setup files, nothing fancy at all. Um, has a location, but they also have a program. And if I go to the program here and move that away, you're going to see that the command line is setup.exe slash qreboot really suppress. And that's the command line we need to have. We need to modify this. We need to make sure that you allow to install this program as a part of a task sequence, because that's what we're going to do. So I'm not going to have a deployment on this at all. What I'm going to do is this. I'm going to find, in this case, sources. OSD settings, custom settings.ini. And I'm going to specify model, and then I'm going to specify model, and then I'm going to specify control. <laughs> package 001 equals site code, package number, and the installer. And that means that if I have one of these models, this application will be automatically installed. So now I don't need to modify my task sequence. I don't need to change it. Instead, I change this text document, which is going to be faster and more easy. I could also use the database to store this information is. But in usually, we, we just add it in the custom settings.ini file because it's going to be easier. Um, but there are customers that says, no, we want to use the database, and that's fine too. This is the, uh, one of the ideas behind dynamic deployment, and this is really easy to test. The only way to test it when you have it in a task sequence is to run the entire task sequence. When I have it in custom settings.ini, I can just run the CTI gather against that text file to verify that, hey, it's detecting that I am an HP EliteBook 8560W, and therefore I should have this package. So as long as the package works, I know that's going to be deployed. I will that demonstrate means, that in the next demo yeah, as well. So. That means we're going to sh shorten down all the testing. I hate the fact that the only way to test something is to deploy Windows and watch Windows being installed for two hours and then say, no, I forgot a comma. And then you do it again. Oh, uh, this should be a space in between. And then you do it again. And at 3 p.m. in the afternoon, you realize that you have done nothing for the entire day. And then you go home and cry. I have the 3D drive guard <laughs> open here. Yes. So what Michael was about to show before was that once you download these drivers from the download manager and you view the CVA file, if you drill down uh, in that file, you will see the command line switches for the various uh, applications that is required or to run them silently. So. And it's kind of funny because at, at every time we are at the customer and we show this, usually nobody's seen it before. So they ask, is this a new feature? And I, I do pay attention to the, to the line down here as well. Uh, this can also be interesting sometimes, the return codes, because in Config Manager, you can configure you know, success codes when you run things. So you may want to adjust them as well to match the application. For example, the HP Sum that is used for servers and some clients as well have 
interesting odd, interesting <laughs> return codes yeah. for, for some of its successful deployments. Yeah. And you want them to be successful when they are. So I know that zero is successful. One is successful. And one is two. And three and five. And, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. We don't, we don't really know why, but yeah. that's the way it works. So this is the way we deal with applications. Do I really need to install these applications? No, but in some cases we do. And if that's the case, this is the way we install drivers as applications. So speaking of, of apps then, well, that was the demo. Um, <laughs> how do we sign applications in our sequences? Well, we have a few different options. We can either hard code them into each and every sequence that we have, and that typically ends up in you guys having 10, 15, 20 different sequences just because you want to have different lists of apps in those sequences. Even if you can do conditions, I typically see a lot of customers having a bunch of sequences when they assign them statically. Another way to doing this is to create lists dynamic lists of applications that you simply feed into the sequence. And Michael showed you an example on doing that dynamically on a per model basis. So what we do to, uh, used to do uh, this with is of course the, um, that the file that Michael uh, talked about before. So let me go back to my demo environment and close this one for now. Here I have an example. Um, where I have a dynamic deployment, I have a single sequence, could be Windows 7, could be Windows 8, could be Windows 10, but it will behave differently where the system detects I'm deploying to a laptop or a desktop or a server. Because when you start a deployment, the sequence learns about all these functions Hundreds of ready-made functions are, are being read in and used, and a three of them is the detection of laptop, desktop, or server. And then I can do different actions depending on what the result is. So if it is a laptop, it's going to deploy the following three apps. So the VPN client office an Adobe Reader, and it's going to put the machine also into the laptop's OU. But if it detects it's a desktop machine instead, it will rather just install two apps, not the VPN client, and put them into a desktop OU. And if it's a server, it will do nothing of that, but just put the server into the server OU. So. What we could do is add, I mean, you have by laptop type, desktop type, zero type. I mean, we could add by VM type and you specify. Mean, you mean this one? Yeah, we yeah. can do yeah, that too. Yeah, you can do that too. Yeah. So in this example, it detects if the machine I'm deploying is a virtual machine, and if it is, it will install a package that, in this case, upgrades the, or installs the updated version of the Hyper-V uh, integrated components. And we could actually detect that, hey, it's running on Hyper-V, therefore you should install the integration components. Hey, it's running on VMware, therefore you should install the VMware tools instead. Yeah. So typically in a sequence, what we have here in the default sequence is the install software updates action uh, that will install by default a list of packages that are beginning with the packages prefix. Same goes for applications. It's looking for a different prefix, but it's actually not that prefix. This prefix is application because there is another script that converts this into a different type of list. But the question is, should you use packages or should you be using applications in the sequence before CU4? Packages. Should you be using applications or packages with CU4? Depends. It turns out that Microsoft actually fixed a majority of the issues that were with applications in sequences in CU4. It turned out not all of them, but for most of you, it will be all right. I mean, it's not that difficult to test. Add them in, if it works, it works. But they nail down a lot of bugs that, bugs that has been reported by customers around the globe, and they, they nail down a lot of these uh, issues. But if you still have issues, simply go back to use packages, and that will work. The difference is that when you deploy an app through a sequence, the sequence behaves differently, because what the sequence will do, it will, when you deploy a package, the sequence goes directly and say, hey, give me that package now, and installs it. When you deploy an application, the sequence gets the information about the app, and then hand over to the client to say, hey, client, 
can you please go ahead and install this app, and when you're done, report back to me, and I'll continue to do what I'm supposed to do in the list. So it's a whole different ball game of what the sequence do, and that's, I guess, also why a lot of the, the bugs has been, to, to get that timing right between the handover to the client and the report back. But it also assumes that the client is up to the right version at that point in time. So you want to make sure that you have the latest update of the client installed when you deploy your sequence. And just because you install CU4 on the server, you don't get the updates into the sequence. When you deploy, it will still be the RTM version, not the updated version. So how do you fix that? Well, in the past, what I see a lot of people were doing, they were doing something like this. And I've been doing this for years, being very successful with it. But then, a while back, I started running into a few issues that was just because of this. So how come this works? I mean, I, I'm, how many of you in this room have done this? A good few of you. So how come it works for well, most of you, but some of you it fails? It turns out, and I found out this the hard way, this will install the client just fine. It works. But what if that six months from now, the client, for some reason, need to do a full repair and start to look for the files in that folder, which at that point is no longer present at the system. Then that repair will break. So what I recommend to do is simply skip this and to steal, borrow, uh, a script from the deployment guys, it's available for download, this one. You add that to your sequence, and this script automatically finds all the updates in your client package, copies them locally to a specific folder on the drive, not the SMS sequence variable, but another folder, and then installs those updates. So now you not only get the patch property set correctly, you also have them available in the event the machine needs to do a repair, which is nice. Neat. Neat. But other than that, we talked about the simulation. If I want to test the simulation, I can simply open up a PowerShell prompt, go to that folder, and I can say, all right, what if I would deploy this machine? What applications, or in this case, packages, uh, would be installed? Well, it detected apparently that this was a laptop. So it did install or set installation to uh, put the machine into the laptop, so you, and to also install the Cisco VPN client in this example. So you can test the simulation real quick. And what you also find is that in between tests, you either configure the script to delete the mini -ente folder because it stores the simulation in there. That's where you get all the log files. So either way, um, you have the script do that or you do it manually in between the tests. Uh, it, it's up to you. But let me show you another example that I think is quite useful. Uh, I usually show this as a demo of, of the rules in, in MDT, and that is, what if you, in addition to those apps, also need settings, language settings for the environment? Well, you can have that as well. This is a text file that will simply feed instructions to the sequence to configure a different language, keyboard in this case, depending on what site this is deployed to. This is another one I use all the time. Similar to what Michael showed you, model, drivers, I install different packages for different models, but I also set the screen resolution for that model. And for all other models, the default models, I set the screen resolution to one by one, which is not a very high resolution. What this will cause is the sequence abandon you and start to talk to the setup engine directly and say basically something along these lines. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Setup, but uh, my admin is an uh, idiot. Uh, he tried to set the screen resolution to one by one. I, I, I know you can't do that, so what would you like to have? So it will ask the video adapter for the recommended screen resolution. Do you know the one that is in bold? 
when you set screen resolution on a machine. So this shorthand, these two lines, actually enables auto detection of screen resolution in Config Manager, which otherwise will default by 1024 by 768, which I think few of you, I know one of the first row has screens with that, but most of you probably don't have screens that run on 1024 by 768, probably have higher than that. So this enables auto detection of screen resolution, but I can still do exceptions and configure and say, no, for that model, I would like to have that screen resolution. All right. So that was apps. Boom, boom, boom. That was a demo. That was demo. And then we have uh, the advanced stuff. This was just the basic stuff so far. Yep. So the advanced stuff is um, one of the things that we really strongly believe in is that when you're deploying a client operating system or a server, when, when, when it's done, it should really be done. It should be ready for being used. And when we come to customers, that's not really the case. We ask them, do you have a deployment solution? Absolutely. So when you deploy the client machine, it's ready to be used, yeah. Almost, kind of, sort, sort of. of. Then you don't have a solution. You have a sorry excuse for one. Because if you manually need to do something after the machine is done, then you can never automate it. You can never do self-service. That's going to be impossible. It's always going to be someone that needs to be there. And that's just wrong. So we need to do post OS deployment configuration. We usually use PowerShell scripts, VB scripts, orchestrate the runbooks, or web services to do that. When we need to fiddle around in other systems, we always use either runbooks or we use web services. That's to hand off uh, security and don't have an issue. Um, adding a, a PowerShell script into the Windows P image that moves the computer from one OU to another. It's more or less like making Windows PE a domain admin, and that's kind of bad. <laughs> it's flexible, though. But Someone on Twitter just called us the uh, Laurel and Hardy of Ignite. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that's good. <laughs> so so, so who, is, who is Hardy? Well, we have the problem here. I'm, I'm just, I'm both short and fat. And uh, healthy, I think it's the... Uh, oh, yeah. So we need to do that. Uh, we also uh, believe in using the Microsoft Deployment Database, pretty much. Um, we do need to add properties. We need to add information. And we see customers struggling with that and trying to use the Configuration Manager database to, uh, to, to populate it. And it's not really that easy because it was never really designed to that. So it's much easier to have the MDT database as an extension. Sometimes we need to um, do a refresh of a machine or a replace of a machine. And in that case, we might need to do a backup. So what is the consideration uh, that you have if you're gonna do a backup or not? I mean, there's a decision point here. You can't do backup of every machine in the entire environment, right? But you need to do backup of a few machines. The people that you work with that does have the, if, uh, the, the, the power to affect your salary is the people that you should do a backup of before you blow the machine. It's very simple. It works at HR. Let's do a backup. So what you could do here is, is for instance, a very simple thing. Let's specify all the computers that is very important. Put them in a group in Active Directory. If a machine is a member of that group, then we will automatically do a backup before we do a replace or a refresh. We could create something called protected computers and say, well, this is a protected computer. And if anyone tries to install a new computer with that name, we're gonna block it. That doesn't exist by default. And we've seen that. I do have a customer that is deploying servers and they don't have that blocking feature. And someone accidentally just deployed the server 
with a name that is already in use. Now, it wasn't the name DC01, and, and that's really good. Otherwise, the customer could have problems. So we need to check on that. Uh, we're going to look on the integration with Orchestrator. Uh, and another thing that is very interesting, and, and this is just for fun. When we work with customers, I usually ask them, would you like to like, have a web page that you can see? Yeah. Can we have a web page that shows every deployment? Yeah. Oh, that's really cool. No, that's really simple. Can I have an email for every machine that's being deployed? Why would you have that? You can have a report. Yeah, but just having an email is so easy. So we can use the deployment monitoring feature within MDT together with Configuration Manager to extend that to give you really simple status reports that is web-based. So let's start with doing that, right? Yes, sir. So which one should we do first? Pick one. Uh, pick one. Okay, so let's, um, let's have this scenario. Uh, you're deploying a machine, you pre-populated the database, and you want the machine to be in a specific collection. After it has been deployed using Configuration Manager, you want to put that machine in a collection. It's a static collection. The reason is because that machine belongs to a role or a certain function, so you need to have it in a collection. Well, that's collection ID. Okay, so let's do that. Number one, we need to modify the database. In this case, we have the uh, MDT database next to the Configuration Manager database. And let's go to Tables. Let's go to Settings and Columns. And here you can see all the columns that we have. And what is actually really supported is to create new ones. New column. Do you have a good name for a collection ID? VM Monstra Departments. <laughs> <laughs> Unless it's used already. Collection ID is, there's nothing wrong with simple name. Yeah. Collection ID, uh, let's specify that as an Okay, so you save that. I've saved it. That's good. Then, we need to execute this. To refresh the view, holding yes. those. So let's create a new query and paste that in and let's run it. Yes. And that means if you go down here to the database, and if we create just one entry, that's going to be fine. And we go to details. We should have collection ID. So now I have the ability to specify collection ID for that computer, for that role, for that model, for whatever you want to specify. So now I have a collection ID. Well, nothing is going to happen with collection ID because we don't really do anything with it currently, but we do have the ability. So if we uh, then uh, specify this in our custom settings.ini file, uh, so let's go to sources, OSD, settings. So if I add the properties collection ID, now it has the ability to read collection ID. It can understand the property of collection ID. So the only thing we need to do now is add the database query to ask for that. Check computer name if it has a collection ID. Then it knows that, well, it does have a collection ID. But we need to move it. And we can use that in here. 
This is the super advanced runbook that moves a computer to a collection based on a collection ID. It's really complicated. And the only thing we need to do is that we need to specify the collection ID as a variable together with the OSD computer name. And then we need to run this within the task sequence. So when we deploy the machine, we run the task sequence. The task sequence runs the run books that has all the information in the task sequence that moves the computer to the correct, correct uh, collection. And this is also configured, not that advanced either. We specify that the collection should be um, from our initialized data. Um, we're using the ID as a type, and I created a rule name. In this case, the rule is going to be, say, OSD underscore added computer name. So if you go into the collection, you're going to see that. It's going to be a direct rule, and the rule definition is going to be uh, the name of the computer itself, which is basically the same thing as you're adding manually a computer to a collection. So how do you run this in a sequence? Well, that's not really complicated either. You find your task sequence. You do edit. You find a step when this is suitable. We should be able to do it. We could do it somewhere here. Let's do it, I know, here. Add MDT. Uh, execute runbook. And if everything is correct, I can use the move computer to collection. <coughs> we do have customers that are using this, but you can extend this even more, of course, to do other things as well. So if you start thinking, and I know I have uh, people in the audience that I know that find, uh, have found out that, hey, doing runbooks makes life easier. So they keep on adding runbooks to automate things. So let's assume that you're going to do like a, a replace. What do you want to do with the old computer? Disable the Active Directory account. Remove it from the uh, VPN device. Remove it from different locations. Maybe you want to update your asset management system. Remove it from your collections. Clean out the machine. This is the old machine. It's dead. It's not supposed to hang around in the system. So you can actually do a life cycle uh, by just adding run books that fits the needs. Does it make sense? Yeah. OK. So that was the database, and just happens to be a run book as well. Um, another thing that. I, not long, not long ago, uh, we did have a customer that says we need to we need to document the system, and I said that's easy. We can do that. Config manager inventory. Yeah. Good. Yeah, but the answer was no. Our asset management system is a really old guy, and he he needs a piece of paper, and I was like, are you kidding me? No, we need a paper. So for every machine you deploy, you need to hand him a paper. Uh huh. You need to upgrade that system. Yeah, we're waiting for him to die. <laughs> he still lives. So I said, well, I can't help you. It is actually possible to do. And this is what we did. So we created uh, something called Dump to Stone Age Asset Management. It's a run book. And what it does is that it, it runs a PowerShell script, actually, that creates an, an RTF file. And an RTF file I can open in Word and I can print it. It's not really that complicated, but let's, let's just see how it looks. So I'm going to run this manually. And I'm using Light Touch here. And the reason I'm using Light Touch is because it's the fastest way to test develop and verify that these custom task sequence works. When they do work, I move them into Configuration Manager for production. That, that saves me days, or at least hours. Let's run it. 
And this sequence, by the way, it's really complicated. It doesn't do anything, then set a lot of parameters together with the computer name, and then it runs this runbook. It's thinking about it. <laughs> it's planning to do things. So, um, Stone Age Asset Management. It's running it. It's grabbing information from, and here's the nice thing, I'm using the same database as with Configuration Manager, so whatever I have in the database, I use it both for, for Lighthouse and for Configuration Manager at the same time. If we go here, you should be able to see that uh, the runbook did run, and if I open this really fancy document, we now have an asset transfer. This is basically the, uh, the PDF document they gave me and said, the document needs to look like this. It was misspelled in two locations, and it was that, and had been that for like six years. Uh, this is correctly spelled, but I think I need to reverse to the misspelled documents so the, the old guy actually can read those documents. I'm not sure, but that's what we're going to do. Um, and this is another example how you can extend things. You also had an example for extending uh, the monitoring thing. Yes, I did. Um, and you know the company that we used to work for? Yes. <laughs> they, they, have, uh, they had a training, and, and the guy really wanted to know if, if, the, if the classroom has been deployed. And I said, yeah, we can do that. Um, so we did create this. Do, 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 do. Yep, here it is. So the only thing we did is that we enabled the MDT integration, that's it. Uh, we enabled MDT monitoring, that's it as well. And then we have this really funky script that connects there. And when it has done that, it's going to run a function that extracts the data and creates a web page. which means that if you go in here and you go to the monitoring tab, you can see that I have a sequence that is running. It seems to be completed. That's good. Okay, so let's fire up this and let's run that. And that means if I start my web page here, like that one, and we go to HTTP colon localhost. We now have a very simple web page that I can use on my cell phone or whatever. It's just easy access. Is the machine deployed, yes or no? Um, the green thing comes from the fact that it says successfully. If it says failed, the text turns into red. The other color that most people is annoyed by, it's, it's peach puff. <laughs> I always get, you know, why did you pick that? I have no idea. I needed to pick a color, and I'm not really a designer, okay? So don't hire me for that, ever. Don't. All right, then there are some other ways that you can use the monitoring environment as well. And, and before showing you that, I will just, this is the link where you can download the script that Michael just showed you. Uh, his site is named Deployment Bunny. Yeah, I'm not kidding. It's, it's cute, right, isn't it? I think it's cute. I'm very impressed. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> anyway, here I have a few running deployments in my environment. And when I go to the monitoring node, you can see I have two PCs running. So how can I get additional information about these PCs? Because obviously I can just double click one and see about how the progress goes uh, into a deployment. But I can do that in other ways in Config Manager as well. I can, for example, query for status messages. I can use the progress reports. But what I also can do is I can create my own queries against these uh, status uh, messages that comes back. So for example, here is my Windows 10 deployments. And if I open that query,
This is just uh, basically a syntax to list all deployment or all messages that comes from this specific deployment ID. And when you look at your various deployments that you have in the console, uh, when you add the column here, uh, deployment ID, this is where you can see them. So here we can see that uh, my Windows 10 sequence is actually having a deployment ID of just that ID. So now if I go back and run that query and set the filter for the last hour, I just started it so that should be okay. I will now have status messages being reported back directly from that deployment that I can review here and, and check on things. But what I also can do if I go back to the monitoring node, I can double click it again. I can actually now remote into that machine. And this is because of the Dart integration. So those of you in the audience that have the MDOP license, you also have access to this. And when you have the MDT integration in Config Manager, you can add the Dart components. It's done through the installation wizard or the configuration wizard. And then it's just very easy to remote into a machine and, and do some things. And of course, you have full interaction with it. And while you are doing this, the keyboard is going to be locked on the real machine. So while you are doing stuff, somebody else can't break what you're doing. So this is quite a nice way to find information about um, ongoing deployments. So a few uh, final tips that hopefully can help you um, debug some of this. I was in a session yesterday um, that Aaron gave. I recommend highly to um, view that uh, online if you didn't see it. It was about the upcoming features in Config Manager SP2. Again, we're being released next week, and also the Config Manager Vnext that is going to be released later this year. But that was a good summary of sessions, and he also introduced some changes that comes with the service pack, especially around logging, where we now have easier ways to increase the log file size. Currently in 2012, uh, you have to put an SMS TSINI file into the boot image to do that, or use the, the uh, a little hack that the one that guys, uh, guys at 1E put together to do it in a refresh, uh, but, but now they're adding it in, in, in SP2 as well. As you probably know, um, seam trace is included always in the boot image, but what I do recommend to, um, to do as well is to make sure it's always in the path. So put it in the folder so you can always access it, which is a nice, nice thing there. But I wanted to show you uh, one final configuration that is really, uh, a small thing really, but that can help you uh, a lot of things in, in terms of debugging. And I will close this one down. It's a text file again. It's our INI files. Let me go to the right machine, that will help. Because all logging by default is client side in Config Manager, in addition to the status messages. And um, by adding a single line to the text file, this one here, it will configure it to in addition to the log files. It will do server-side logging. If something goes wrong, it will copy the log files to the server. If it's successful, it will copy the log files to the server. So you can use this uh, to make sure you always have those log files available for troubleshooting. And this scenario, the system is smart enough to reach out into the system and grab you additional files, like the dism log file, that the net setup log file, setup act log file, that can help you debug why a setup failed for some reason. So it's a pretty smart script that looks for all these different files. This one is being called in a sequence in Config Manager uh, right here. There is an action that's being called, or a group that's being called. Here. You can add your additional troubleshooting things here as well. You could, for instance, add a runbook that runs the runbook and sends an email and gather the logs files and, I don't know, yeah. call someone, order a pizza, yeah. if you want to do that. Another thing I see a lot of companies are using are status filter rules in Config Manager. You can create a, a filter that, that for example, uh, looks for these events, which is a successful deployment, the task sequence manager is the component, um, 
and then you can have that filter trigger something uh, demo um, to run a script that does something. So all in all, there are many, many options in Config Manager with the integration of MT to do some uh, really advanced deployments. And that means that we have a, a massive amount of 14, 13 seconds left of this session. I would like you to thank your time coming here this morning. Please remember this and have a great rest of the conference. Thank you, guys. Thank you.